Good morning. I'm going to get us started. I'm going to have uh, Mithya go ahead and introduce our guest and uh, welcome you again to a uh, wonderful August. Hi. Uh, my name is Mithya Lewis Newby. I'm in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine and one of the cardiac intensivists. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Robert Trug. Uh, Dr. Trug comes to us today from Boston as a visiting professor for our uh, Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Division. And uh, he is going to be our keynote speaker tomorrow for our uh, Pediatric Critical Care Annual Ron Lemaire Symposium. Uh, this year's topic is on end-of-life care for children in the ICU. Uh, however, today I am delighted to present him for Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. Trug is a professor of medical ethics, anesthesia, and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and a senior associate in uh, critical care medicine at Children's Hospital Boston. He received his medical degree from UCLA, and he is board certified uh, in all of those specialties. He also holds a master's degree in philosophy from Brown University. Uh, Dr. Trug practices pediatric critical care medicine at Children's Hospital Boston and served as the chief of the division for 10 years. His current major administrative roles include Director of Clinical Ethics in the Division of Medical Ethics in the Department of Social Medicine at Harvard, and Director of the Institute for Professionalism and Ethical Practice at Children's Hospital Boston. Uh, he has published more than 200 articles in bioethics uh, and related disciplines, including organ donation, and has recently published National Guidelines for Improving End-of-Life Care in uh, Pediatric Intensive Care Units. He is the PI for an R01 grant from the NIH uh, to improve end-of-life care in uh, pediatric intensive care units as well. Uh, today he'll be speaking on a very timely and hot topic, uh, the ethical implications of organ donation after cardiac death. To give you just a very brief local perspective, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, Children's Hospital put into place for the first time uh, a policy on donation after cardiac death. And eight months ago, we had our first and still only uh, experience with this type of organ donation. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Trug. Thank you, Mithya. It's, uh Great uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I was telling you on the ride over from the airport yesterday that uh, Seattle is on the very short list of places that I would like to live. And in fact, uh, on a couple of occasions, I applied to training programs here in the hopes of being able to live here. But let's just say I was not given the opportunity uh, in either case. No hard feelings, <laughs> sort of. Um, but uh, life goes on, and uh, as Amitya said, I know you have a, a program around donation after cardiac death, so I hope you'll find my comments uh, relevant anyway and, and maybe somewhat interesting. This is my disclosure slide. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Am I too loud? No? Okay. Um, I tend to project when I get in front of a group, and sometimes it gets deafening, so uh, I hope I don't do that. Um, so just to frame this and orient you, there's two main pathways to organ donation. Both begin with the question of whether or not the patient is dead. In the brain death pathway, we seek to establish the irreversible loss of all brain function, and then the organs are removed while the heart is still beating and being perfused by oxygenated blood. In the donation after cardiac death pathway, we establish death through the irreversible loss of cardiac function, and then the organs are removed two to five minutes after cardiac arrest, and that depends on the individual hospital policy. That range is what has been approved by the Institute of Medicine. So we're gonna look specifically at DCD, and I'm gonna raise uh, five areas of ethical concern. First is the impact of DCD upon the quality of end-of-life care. Second, two different kinds of conflicts of interest, whether and in when to withdraw life support and whether to be an organ donor. I want to explore with you a little bit whether the donors are really dead, and if I'm successful at raising some questions about that, ask you whether it really does matter, and uh, explore reconsidering the so-called dead donor rule, and then close with some comments about societal trust and its impact on organ donation. 
So let's start with uh, looking at the impact of DCD upon the quality of end-of-life care. Um, as Mithi, I'm sure, would, would uh, attest in my experience, this is one of the things that we take a great deal of pride in in intensive care medicine, is doing end-of-life care well. It's got to be one of the most horrible experiences for any family to go through. And uh, to make it go as smoothly and as least horribly as, as possible is something that uh, is a high priority for us. But DCD poses a number of challenges to the, those goals. So instead of withdrawing support in the familiar environment of the ICU, the children need to be transported from the ICU down to the OR. Life support is then withdrawn in this environment, which, you know, from having been in operating rooms, is not a warm and fuzzy kind of uh, place. Many DCD protocols involve the use of interventions while the child is still alive, including the placement of invasive catheters like central venous lines, medications to preserve uh, the function of the organs like heparin, and continuous monitoring of pulse and cardiac function, which of course is not something that we would typically do during end-of-life care. All protocols say that the children should receive just exactly the same type of sedation and analgesia in the operating room that they would have received if they'd been in the intensive care unit. But there's pressures on this, pressures to both give too much sedation and analgesia as well as pressures to give too little. So, for example, one of the things about DCD protocols is that if the child does not die within 60 minutes of withdrawal of life support, the view is they can no longer donate their organs because the organs have gone through a period of hypoperfusion. So that after 60 minutes, they need to be transported from the, IC, from the operating room back to the ICU for continued end-of-life care. And uh, we know from my own experience uh, in my hospital that when this happens, uh, parents experience it really very much as a second loss. Not only have they, they lost their child to a tragic situation, but here they've made a decision to donate the organs, and now they're being denied that opportunity as well. And so the concern is that as that clock moves towards the 60-minute mark, where it will not be uh, permissible for organ donation to occur, a lot of people want to make sure that it happens. And so there's pressure to maybe give a little bit more analgesia than you would to assure that, that cardiac arrest occurs. On the flip side of that, nobody doing end-of-life care in this situation wants to be accused of doing euthanasia. And so there's concerns about giving too much. And indeed, in a report from Denver that I'll review with you in a moment, they specifically noted that the children in their DCD protocol received less sedation and analgesia than similar children who were not organ donors. So that's good in terms of making the point that they weren't doing euthanasia, okay? But it raises the concern, did the children actually experience uh, suffering that they might not otherwise had experienced if they weren't going to be organ donors? So it cuts both ways, and it's complicated. There's an abrupt separation of the parents from the child at the moment of asystole. So in the ICU, of course, families have as much time as they want to be with their child after death is declared. But under DCD protocols, the moment that asystole occurs, separation needs to happen immediately, either by the child being moved into a different operating room, as at my hospital, or by the parents immediately leaving um, the, the operating room. And then, as I mentioned, if asystole does not occur within this time period of 60 minutes, the whole thing is off, and you have to get back in the elevator and come back to the ICU. So there are a number of challenges around this, and I think, you know, they're just what it is. I mean, if we're going to do DCD, we need to deal with these things. Uh, there was a paper uh, published a few years ago that looked at this in a more quantitative way. They looked at uh, a number of domains of end-of-life care that are shown along the left side there, and the, uh, the quality indicators, which are in the middle column, that are associated with those domains. And um, by their analysis of 53 identified quality indicators for end-of-life care, DCD was compatible with only 19 of those. So again, um, it's not a showstopper. doesn't mean we can't do it. But these are, I think, realities that we need to acknowledge and challenges and hurdles that we need to overcome. The second uh, concern I have and want to share with you are around conflicts of interest. Whether and when to withdraw life support 
and whether to be an organ donor. Let me read this quote to you. It seems inevitable that the fact that someone else is waiting for this patient's kidney must, to some extent, influence the decision, that is, the decision to withdraw life support, since the longer the injured patient is connected to the machines, the more his kidneys and other vital organs are likely to deteriorate. Okay? I mean, that makes common sense. What's interesting to me about that quote is that it's not recent. That comes from 1964, more than 45 years ago. And I say that those ethical issues with transplantation back then have really remained very much the same. Now, with DCD, the policy statements have said, oh, no, this is not really a problem at all. Because what we say in our policy statements is that we are going to build a firewall between the decision to withdraw and the decision to donate. The decision to withdraw is made entirely independently first, and only then do you move on to the decision to donate. And it sounds very good on paper, but I believe that in actual practice, it's much more complex than that. And in fact, while these are different decisions, there is no firewall between them, but rather they morph from one into the other. So for example, if we look at this question of whether and when to withdraw, uh, those of you who, who work in this environment well know that if we want to maximize prognostic certainty for a child, we want to delay the decision to withdraw. So when a family says to us, we know that you know, you're telling us that our child is not going to survive, we just want to be really, really sure, our tendency, quite appropriately, is to say, that's no problem. We'll wait a little bit longer. We'll gain more prognostic certainty. But when you throw organ donation into the mix, and you want to maximize transplantation potential, then that leads you to accelerate the decision to withdraw. The sooner you do it, the more likely the organs are going to be viable. And this is not just a conflict for those of us who are the clinicians, because many times, of course, it's the parents who are also highly motivated to want to donate the organs. And so they're struggling with this as well. On the one hand, we'd like to wait. We want to be really sure. On the other hand, we know that the longer we wait, the less likely it is that our child's organs will be usable. So, again, instead of seeing this as a firewall between these two decisions, I think we should acknowledge that this tension is at play. And we should think about how to ethically manage it rather than just pretend that it doesn't exist. Another way that this firewall has been framed is to say that, okay, we will only inform the family of the DCD option after they've already made the decision to withdraw life support. Right? So if they don't even know it's a possibility, it can't contaminate their decision making. Well, problematic at a couple levels. First of all, it doesn't deal with our conflict, because of course we know about DCD. Secondly, I think the premise is, is naive on one hand, because as DCD becomes better known, more families will become aware of it. And it's also uh, unfair in a strange sort of way. We don't rely on the ignorance of families about medical options in order to assure that they make good medical decisions. So again, I think you know, the policy statements and everything else say, oh yeah, no problem, we've got a firewall here. I think the reality is in fact very different. We should face the reality, we should think about how to manage these conflicts of interest and not just ignore them. How about whether to become an organ donor? Let me ask you, when we are counseling families about organ donation, what is the goal? Is it to maximize organ donation rates, or is it to help families make the decision that's right for them, all things considered? So let me be provocative and ask you as a group. How many would say that it is to maximize organ donation rates? One, two, three, okay. All right, and how many would say it's to help families make the decision that's right for them, all things considered? Okay, so uh, the majority uh, went with the second one. And I want to say that um, I think either one can be ethically defended. If we say it is to maximize organ donation rates, I think it will depend on arguments about uh, organs being seen as community resources, uh, that there's an ethical obligation to donate one's organs, and indeed these arguments are all in the ethics literature. And I think that it can be defended. But the point is, is that most of us say that it's to make the right decision for the family, all things considered. But as I want to share with you, our systems are all set up the other way. They are all set up to maximize organ donation rates. And let me 
show you some of the ways. So we have rules that require hospitals to notify the local organ bank, the OPO, of all impending deaths, and to require that the person who initiates the request from the family to be an OPO representative or somebody who has been trained by them. And the reason for this is because we know that if you can sort of move the clinicians out of the way and move OPO representatives into the discussions with the family, that you will optimize the conversion rate. And this, is, this has been clearly shown, and I believe it to be true. The thing that um, makes a difference is that organ bank representatives go through a training process that involves a couple of key elements. One is the notion of dual advocacy, which is whereas the clinicians are there solely for the benefit of the child, an OPO representative has two goals. One is to represent the goals of the child, but also to represent the needs of those who need to have a transplanted organ. So there is a divided loyalty here, which is explicitly a part of the ethics of that job. And second, part of that training involves what's called the presumptive approach to donation. And let me share with you some of what's involved there. Uh, this comes from a paper, which is something of a training manual for organ bank representatives about how to have conversations with families. On the left side is the standard approach, which for these purposes is the old approach, it's the one you should not do, and on the right side is the presumptive approach, the new approach, the accepted approach. So under the standard approach, one would say, this is Mary, she works with families like yours who have lost a loved one. Would it be possible for her to speak with you for a moment? That's the wrong way. The correct way. Mary is a member of our team. She is going to speak with you and answer any questions you might have. So the, the goal here is to frame the OPO representative as part of the clinical team. But I think this is covering up the fact that there is a mixed loyalty here. There is the dual advocacy as part of that role. Nothing wrong with that, but I think it's misleading to families to believe that this person is stepping into their clinical care and counseling them with this undisclosed divided loyalty. I'm here to provide you with information about organ donation. Wrong. Correct? I'm here to provide you with the opportunity to donate your loved one's organs. Some families choose the option of donating their loved one's organs. I am here to help you make the decision that is best for you and your family. The question I just asked you. That's not the right approach. The right approach. You and your husband now have the opportunity to make your son a hero through the gift of organ donation. Wrong approach. We will support whatever choice you make. Correct. Most people, if given the chance to save a life, will do it. Wrong approach. If you decide to donate, correct, when you decide to donate. And finally, would you like me to give you some time before you make your decision? No. If you do not have any more questions, I will now guide you through this process. So my point here is if, as most of you said, the goal is explicitly to help families make the right decision for them, the process is not set up to deliver on that goal. I think an interesting analogy here can be made to research. I think there's a lot of analogies between research and being an organ uh, donor. For research, the willingness of patients to be research subjects is essential for medical progress. It's a good thing. Just like donating organs is a good thing. It supports our transplantation uh, enterprise. Uh, unquestionably a good. Willingness to participate in both is truly a gift to others. To be a research subject or to be an organ donor is a gift. Yet we have very strict standards for informed consent and management of conflict of interest around the research enterprise. Uh, for those of you who do research, can you imagine if the training manual for your research coordinator looked like the training manu manual for OPO coordinators? I mean, it wouldn't have a chance of getting through an IRB. Um, and, and yet we, we're accepting it in one case, but not in another. And then finally, I want to point out uh, a, a problem with um, the Uniform Anatomic Gift Act. This is the, the, um, the prototype law that states adopt that governs uh, organ donation. And it gets revised periodically, and the last revision was in 2006. And I, I, I put the exact words here uh, for you just uh, to make it clear. But uh, rather than read it to you, what this says is that it's not okay to withhold life support from anyone until you know whether or not they could be an organ donor. Even if they specifically say they do not want that life support, even if they have a do, do not resuscitate order. So to take the worst case scenario, and 
this may sound you know, inflammatory, but if somebody comes in to the emergency room with a do not resuscitate order, the law literally would require you to intubate and resuscitate that patient until it could be determined whether or not they were an organ donor. Now, when this, this was written in this way, I don't know exactly why, uh, when this problem was pointed out, everyone said, oh, that's not what the law was intended to be. There's been some commentary written saying that's not what it was intended to be. Nevertheless, the law has not been changed. And uh, more than 20 states have actually adopted this into their state law. And I think it, it's terribly problematic. And I doubt that anyone would actually push it this way, but I think it shows the way that all of the regulations have been aligned in order to simply maximize the conversion rate. Okay. Um, let's go on to, I think, you know, one of the, the big and, for me, one of the most interesting questions is, are DC donors dead? And let me uh, refer to this article that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was the experience at Denver Children's Hospital with uh, three infants who were cardiac donors uh, where successful transplants occurred. And the reason why this paper achieved the notoriety is because, as I already told you, the Institute of Medicine has said that there needs to be a two to five minute interval after the onset of asystole until the patient is declared dead. And what they did here was they pushed that down to 75 seconds. And the, the obvious reason being that the sooner one can remove the heart, um, that the, the more likely it's going to function well. Okay? Um, now, you, as I mentioned, the law says that in order to be declared dead, you have to have the irreversible loss of cardiac function. So did these infants have the irreversible loss of cardiac function? So I, I'd ask you just to look at this logically. If a heart procured from a donor on the basis of the irreversible loss of its function is transplanted and functions in the chest of another patient, how could the loss of that function have been irreversible? I mean, it, it just sort of seems to be logically impossible. Now, this has been thought of and dealt with, and the argument goes like this. Well, irreversible doesn't really mean that you can't reverse. What it means is that you've chosen not to reverse. And so now we turn to auto-resuscitation data, which shows that if you don't touch a patient, uh, the data seems to indicate that hearts do not start by themselves after about 75 seconds. And so that's where the 75 seconds in the, Do in the Denver protocol comes from. Everybody agrees that even with the IOM intervals of two minutes and five minutes, if we tried to restart the heart, in many cases we would be successful. But the reason they say we can call it irreversible is because we have chosen not to try. Now, I think that there's some problems with this choose not to reverse interpretation of irreversibility. Let me just give you a little thought experiment here. Imagine a young athlete who suffers massive brain injury in an automobile accident. His family agrees to DCD donation. Life support is withdrawn, and he is asystolic for five minutes. Uh, under all of our protocols, now he would be declared dead. So the answer to that would be yes, and he could be an organ donor. But now imagine that a similar young athlete suffers a cardiac arrest while playing basketball. No one initiates CPR. EMS is called and arrives six minutes later. Is this person dead? Well, now I think there's ambiguity here. If we go by the choose not to reverse you know, definition or, or a, a strict definition of irreversibility, um, I think it's confusing. And I think it, it, it shows the kinds of ambiguities and paradoxes that come into play when we start to tinker around with what it means to be irreversible. Or to give you another example, if I throw someone who cannot swim into the water with no intention of saving them, is their drowning irreversible as soon as they hit the water? I have chosen not to save them. Does that mean that it's irreversible? Are they dead the moment they hit the water? It, it, it becomes more tortuous, doesn't it? Or let's take something that's actually more realistically possible. Consider a Denver scenario where the mother changes her mind at 75 seconds. So the life support is withdrawn. Child has cardiac arrest, 75 seconds goes by, the child is declared legally dead, and in a moment of intense grief, the mother says, I changed my mind, I don't want this, please resuscitate my child. And let's say for whatever reason, they do. 
and let's say they quite plausibly get a heart rate back? How do we think about this? Has this child been raised from the dead? What, what's going on here? Again, tortuous ways in my mind of understanding irreversibility in order to fit with the dead donor rule. I include this slide uh, by Eri Jaffe, a um, colleague from Canada, uh, who did a survey of university-affiliated pediatricians like yourselves, presented them with a scenario of a patient described as dead with absent circulation for five minutes. A lot of disagreement about this. 60% agreed that the patient is definitely dead, 50% in a state called dead, 56% agreed we're being truthful when we're calling the patient dead. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot of ways that people are trying to frame this, but I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is just that um, there's disagreement even within our own community. Okay, so now let me ask you, if I've, if I've put at least some doubt in your mind as to whether these patients are dead, does it really matter? So let's uh, reconsider the dead donor rule here by going back to square one. So let me ask you first, consider the ethical vectors, if you will, in the Denver case. Three children certain to die from devastating brain injury. Parents highly motivated to donate may benefit psychologically from this chance to donate. Three children certain to die if a transplant is not available. You know, it seems to me, if you look at the ethical vectors here, everything is pointing in the right direction. I can't think of any reason why they shouldn't be allowed to do this. I can't think of any reason. And so the question then is, why even wait 75 seconds? Why are you even jeopardizing the quality of the organ by waiting even that long? Here's one of the recipients of one of those hearts in Denver, obviously a, a healthy little boy. His parents look a little strange in this picture, but he looks, <laughs> he looks great. I mean, it's pretty ethically compelling, isn't it? Um, and so, you know, here's sort of the question. If one has a lethal brain injury and there is a request to donate, why are we going through an orchestrated death? You know, to meet some sort of criteria that don't even make a whole lot of sense. Why aren't we moving directly to organ donation? Under anesthesia, of course, we don't want these patients to suffer. And the reason is, perhaps the first commandment of medical ethics, doctors must not kill. I mean, this is a, a pretty fundamental ethical requirement for all of us, isn't it? And so that's where we get to the dead donor rule. You can't take these organs out if these patients are still alive, so we've got to make some way of at least calling them dead before we remove these organs. So I know this is very deeply ingrained in our DNA, uh, doctors must not kill. And so I'm going to ask you for a moment to relax your brain a little bit and consider another way of looking at it for, for a second. So I'd like you to imagine removing a ventilator from a patient in a permanently vegetative state in accord with the patient's advanced directive and at the family's request. And I would like you to ask yourself, if you were in this position, would it be an ethical thing to do? So I know this is only a skeleton, but um, how many would say that's an ethical thing to do? So, right, most of us say so. Okay. Now I'd like you to ask yourself, did I cause the patient's death? And I would say that for most of us, we resist that very much. We don't like to think so. But think about it a little bit more. But for your action to remove that ventilator, this patient could have lived for months, maybe even years longer. Within the law, a very common understanding of causation is what's called but for causation. But for your action here, such a thing would not have happened. And I think this meets that standard. But for your action to remove the ventilator, this person would not have died at this time, might have lived a very much longer period of time, maybe even years. I think it's hard to avoid saying that you did not cause that person's death by removing the ventilator. As much as we want to resist it, I think it's kind of irre irresistible. Um, and I would say that we often engage in these death-causing acts. And whether they are right or wrong depends on other factors. Not just that they cause death, but on other factors. 
What was the patient's condition and prognosis? Certainly it would be wrong if you removed this ventilator from somebody that we expected to survive. Or the patient's expressed wishes. Do you have consent? That's critically important. The family's view. They need to be involved in this decision, obviously. And then there's the fact that you, as physicians, are socially sanctioned to engage in death-causing acts. Not everybody can just walk in and do this. There's something about your role here that's important. And so for all of these reasons, I think it is ethical for physicians to perform death-causing acts. Some that we do quite routinely without even thinking about it, such as withdrawal of a ventilator, or withdrawal of pressors, or withdrawal of dialysis, or withdrawal of tube feedings. Those things we've come to see as quite routine. I would argue those are death-causing acts. And removal of vital organs can also be a death-causing act. And I think that we could see these as being ethical depending on the circumstances. I like this quote from Henry Beecher. You know, Henry Beecher was, uh, some call him the father of modern bioethics. He was the chair of the Harvard Brain Death Committee. Uh, in 1969, he wrote, once the decision is made to terminate the situation, to turn off the respirator, what difference does it make whether the heart is stopped by an exorable asphyxia or by removal? Okay. I mean, it's in some ways the argument that, that I'm proposing to you here. So one of my uh, friends and colleagues is Frank Miller. He's a uh, philosopher at the NIH. And so he and I have been writing about this topic uh, recently in the New England Journal and the Hastings Center Report. And um, uh, I think one of the most common objections that we've heard is that this approach would absolutely destroy societal trust. It would completely erode uh, the, the, the public support of organ donation, that uh, the organ donation enterprise would come to a grinding halt, and uh, you know, that would be a horrible thing. Let me say, I'm the first to say that would be a horrible thing if it happened. But let's look at that assumption. Um, let's look at how society thinks about the dead donor role. Now, one of my uh, hobbies, if you will, is collecting media accounts of uh, brain death and uh, organ donation. So I've got a shoebox full of newspaper clippings. Let me share a couple of them with you. Here's one from the New York Times. The brain dead are candidates for a donation, but the operation generally must be performed before death. Now, that's wrong, right? I mean, we know that that's wrong sitting here in this room. You would think that uh, this would uh, provoke all sorts of letters to the New York Times saying, what, oh my god, you know, doctors are killing patients with their organs? Um, no. The only letter that was written in response to this was mine. I said, you know, you got it wrong, and it was a correction on page 35. I mean, this was not a big deal. Uh, one from my hometown, uh, the patient was being kept alive so doctors could harvest his organs for donation. This is, I'll tell you, I, I follow this pretty closely, 95 to 99% of media accounts are framed in this way. Uh, brain dead woman gives birth, then dies. Um, <laughs> but here's my favorite, okay? This uh, is about Susan Torres, who was a 26-year-old pregnant woman. Um, who was diagnosed uh, with a brain hemorrhage into an undiagnosed brain tumor, and she was declared brain dead. She was maintained on quote-unquote life support, because of course it wasn't life support, um, and then she delivered a small premature uh, child. So a couple years ago I was on vacation in uh, Utah, and we'd come back from a hike, and I was kind of flipping through the channels, and I come across Larry King. And here's this story, and I sit down, and I, I couldn't believe what I saw. So here's what I saw. So uh, they're presenting this story, and Larry King has Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who we all know well, the neurosurgeon from Atlanta, chief medical correspondent for CNN, recently uh, proposed as Surgeon General for the United States. And uh, so Larry King says, and Dr. Gupta, we should explain again in your medically, is a brain-dead person dead? He says, well, you know, a dead person really means that the heart is no longer beating. I mean, that's going to be the strict definition of it. So a brain-dead person is someone who has no chance of recovery, has no brain function, is requiring artificial support to be alive. But people do draw a distinction between brain-dead and dead. This is where the whole field of organ transplantation sort of came to be, Larry, based on that distinction. Now, to me, this is a fascinating window into how many of us view brain death and the dead donor rule. Yeah, for goodness sake, this isn't some lay person who doesn't really think about this stuff very often. This is a neurosurgeon. 
certainly should understand the ins and outs of brain death. And yet he has it wrong from A to Z here. Everything he says is wrong, and yet I think speaks very deeply to many people's intuitions about these things. That brain death isn't really death. The heart stopping is death. That what justifies organ donation is the prognosis, the fact that this person uh, is going to die anyway, is dependent upon machines, etc. And um, so again, I, I find this as sort of uh, uh, revealing in a very interesting way about how many of us may think. And in, indeed, people have, uh, have surveyed the lay public about this as well. Here's a survey of Ohio residents presented with various scenarios of brain death, coma, and PVS. And the punchline is, for those who provided logically consistent answers across the scenarios, almost half were willing to donate the organs of patients that they considered to be alive. That is, in violation of the dead donor rule. Now, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the word gerrymander. It's uh, primarily a political term. It refers to dividing an area into political units to give special advantages to one group, and it's commonly frowned upon in the, in the political world. When I think about the trust of the public, I worry that their perception might become that we are drawing the lines between life and death in very convenient ways and precisely where they maximize organ donation. And I worry a lot about this in terms of public trust. Now, since uh, I've have published the articles that I showed you. One of the most common uh, criticisms I've seen, mostly on websites, but also somewhat in, in the literature, is that uh, you know, Dr. Trug and Dr. Miller's position is utilitarian, as if to label it utilitarian somehow also labels it as being evil. I mean, there's nothing unethical about utilitarianism per se, and I would defend it if, in fact, our, our argument was utilitarian. But I guess I just am a little sensitive about this point. I want to make it clear that I don't think it is utilitarian at all. Utilitarian strategies do tend to subjugate individual rights and liberties to the common good. That is true. But what I'm suggesting to you is that, basic, that we base donation upon devastating neurological injury and the request of a patient and family to donate. I think that this is definitely not utilitarian reasoning. On the other hand, I think that claiming to respect the dead donor rule while bending the definition of death however necessary in order to facilitate organ procurement, that is a utilitarian strategy. And so I think we're actually on very much the other side of this. So my conclusions, uh, which I know are controversial, uh, are that DCD donation does not conform to the dead donor rule. I think it flies in the face of common logic about what it means to be irreversible. But I do believe it is ethical. I think it's ethical because it has been requested by the donor or surrogate and because the patient is imminently dying. And I think we should recognize that. And I think that there would be a lot of advantages to clarifying the ethics of DCD. I think concerns about it undermining the trust of the public are overblown. Uh, obviously, there would need to be uh, explanation going on, but I think we're going to need explanation as the public becomes more and more aware of actually the way we have already constructed the ethics of organ donation, which uh, is, is problematic. And um, actually, we've, we've crunched some numbers on this, which I could go over if it comes up in the discussion, but um, I think actually that basing the ethics of DCD donation upon a different foundation would actually enhance the availability of organs for transplantation. So with that, I will stop, uh, and I, I hope uh, that we'll have some good discussion. Please, if for those of you who disagree with me, don't hold back. I'm used to it. So, uh, Tom? Bob, that was great. I don't disagree with your general approach, but I have a question back from the very beginning. When you asked us to raise our hands about what we thought the goal of the policies were, I was one of the few people who actually did raise my hand to say it is to maximize organ donation. But what was interesting to me was when I read through that list of the two approaches, and almost every single time I was still on the standard approach, not the presumptive approach. And so my question, my, my comment and a question back for you is that it occurs to me that one can acknowledge a goal of maximizing organ donation and then imposing a, 
a whole series of constraints to be very mindful about how we want to respect families and how to interact with families and give them, op give them options available, even while acknowledging our plan is to increase this. I actually do think in that regard, though, that your approach is a way of potentially maximizing donation effectively while still offering that respect. Yeah, th thanks. And that was why I put the analogy to research in there. Because, you know, we're recognizing that for medicine to move forward, we need to encourage more people to participate in research. It's a good thing. We want to encourage them to do it. And yet, at the same time, we're very careful about respecting their right to have an informed choice. And I feel like the, the whole structure of approaching families around organ donation is deceptive. I mean, I thought that those quotes to me seemed deceptive. Maybe they did to you. So thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, talk. And I think uh, being from a, a research perspective, I, I, I appreciate your comments. And I, I wonder whether this, this issue that was just raised uh, can also be viewed from the, from the point of view of the, the task for different – there's one task for society – to determine what's the optimal way to optimize organ donation. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's appropriate to think of the task of the, of the provider for the patient from a different framework. And those, while potentially in, in conflict or at least in, in juxtaposition, they can both be valid at the same time. It depends on what, what role you're in, what position you're in. That's right, and that's where, um, that's why I was particularly struck by the uh, framing of bringing in OPO representatives. I have no problem with the ethics of being an OPO representative. You know, you're there to encourage organ donation. But to bring them into the clinical realm under the guise of being the clinician is, again, to me, deliberately deceptive. Yeah, thank you very much for presenting this information and, of course, for your editorials. Um, as I listen to what you say, I'm thinking about the needs and rights of individual patients and families, and then the needs and perhaps rights of the health of the population we serve. So my question for you is, can you give us an ethical or an, any approach of how to balance those two? Um, I, I, we struggle with that all the time in medicine and society. Well, so if I'm if I'm reading your question correctly, correct me if I'm not. Um, as a society, we have many people who, whose lives are dependent upon getting an organ transplant. And, and that's a, a legitimate need. And, and somehow, you know, we need to do everything we can to meet that need. Um, and there's been a lot made of what are uh, so-called presumed consent policies that are predominant in southern Europe. Uh, Spain often gets mentioned where, as a society, they have decided that one has agreed to be an organ donor unless you specifically opt out. And there's a process for opting out, but it requires effort. Um, now, those have been discussed in the United States. They've never gotten very far. But I don't see them as intrinsically unethical. I see them as quite compatible with a communitarian view of society, that we owe each other things. And, and, you know, once one is either dead or imminently dead, that we owe each other our organs. Um, I think there's a good argument that can be made around that. But I think that we as a society should come to that agreement together. And then I would have no problem with much of what I told you. But to go under the guise that, oh, no, no, we reject all of that. It's all about individual choice. But then to distort the way the consent process goes, that doesn't seem right. Uh, um, thanks. I had a question uh, kind of on the other side of this. So you've talked a lot about the, don the donor and the aspects around donation, but um, given the paucity of experience, experience we've had transplanting these organs so far um, in, into pediatric patients, I just wonder what you think the obligation is to the um, transplant team, to the recipient, to uh, define or to outline what the differences potentially are between an uh, organ from a brain-dead donor and where we are stopping the heart and procuring the organs right then versus the organs that are taken from, you know, patients where they s slowly die and the heart slowly stops. And, and I think this is one of the things that we struggle with to, 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 
just to fully define to parents, you know, what the differences are because they don't understand the difference between brain dead and cardiac death. And the outcomes may be very different, and we don't know that. So what do you think the application is yeah. to the transplant team? So it's a, it's a complicated but excellent question. Um, the question is, is, how do we inform, if I understand you correctly, how do we inform potential recipients of the different kinds of organs that are out there and what it might mean for them? Now, as you know, in the um, studies that have been done, the long-term outcomes of kidney donation by DCD are said to be equivalent to those from brain-dead organ donors. Higher rate of initial graft failure, but the long-term outcomes are the same. The same can't be said for liver yet, um, and, or for heart or for lung, and hence the motivation of the Denver group to shorten that time down. But, but more to your point, it's how much do we tell recipients and how much choice do we give them over the organ that they're going to receive? Uh, can a family, for example, be on the list and say, I want an organ from a brain-dead donor, but not from a DCD donor? But then it gets even more complicated than that because there are donors that are, quote, in high-risk categories, you know, men who have sex with men and things like that, people with uh, various kinds of potential um, infectious exposures but where it hasn't shown up in their body yet. And uh, the organ banks are struggling with what are their obligations to tell recipients about the details of what... Uh, the organ they might receive uh, might entail versus saying, look it, if you're on the list, you're just going to have to take whatever we give you. And it sort of opens a Pandora's box of how much can a recipient really, do, do they have a right to know? It's the pediatric experience that, you know, the kidney data that you report is an adult. Yes, that's right. And they're relatively low amount of data still in, in kidney donor, which is the vast majority of DCD donors. Uh, and the liver has a little bit more in pediatrics, and the heart you know, is limited mostly to the Denver group. So yeah. I, I just, as we talk about this stuff in, in a recipient, from the recipient yeah. side of it as an institution, what is the obligation to our transplant teams that are accepting yeah. these organs? I, I think that that's, that's a great point. We don't know what it is. And in fact, our hospital is not accepting pediatric kidney transplants from DC donors currently for exactly uh, that reason. It also plays into the fact that uh, parents of children who are going to be organ donors often want the organs to go to children. And the fact is, very few of those organs go to children. They almost all go to adults. And how much of that should be a part of the informed consent process? Yeah. You mentioned the um, issue of the public trust. I think over the 40 plus years of using brain death, there's certainly a public trust in that process. But with these other models that you're proposing or discussing, you know, DCD is a newer model, and perhaps there's, it's unknown what the public trust is in that, and then you're proposing or raising other questions. Can you comment on how we would have to gain or how we could gain the public trust that we would have moral and ethical standing to make these recommendations? Like, I mean, even in the medical research thing, you know, there are, uh, certain socioeconomic groups and uh, a lot of people who don't trust us with yeah. clinical research. And yeah. it seems to be another step beyond that. Well, you know, it, it's hard. I guess, um, you know, in some ways, DCD really stirred the pot because it, it brought a lot of attention back to um, our patients dead and the dead donor role. That had, it was a debate that continued to happen academically, but I don't think was uh, playing much of a role in society. Now you do see a lot of uh, clinicians within hospitals really wondering about what's going on here? How do we know this person is dead? Uh, what are the criteria that we're using? And um, so I think the fact that we've opened up this discussion again um, raises concerns about just maintaining the, the public trust with the status quo. Uh, the the uh, popular press articles that followed the Denver report, for example, some of them were quite inflammatory. Um, it also raises the question that I struggle with as to whether talking about this stuff uh, is irresponsible on my part. You know, if we believe that organ donation is a good thing, why, why um, ruffle feathers? Uh, why rock the boat? Um, now, you know, my personal belief about that, my personal response to that is that we should never be afraid to talk about things in as honest a way as we possibly can, that ultimately get into the bottom of, of things and, and the truth will, will be better for everything. But I do acknowledge that I, I worry a little bit that with what's happening right now and people giving talks like I'm giving, um, could at least in the short term have an adverse effect upon public trust. 
probably doesn't answer your question. How to, how to proceed with that, I think, is, is a complicated issue. I think that your proposal uh, has merit for consideration. I think one of the things I, I worry about as an intensivist is uh, this idea of going forward and saying, look, we cause death all the time. Here's just another way. Uh, and I think, I think that may, might not ring very, uh, uh, in, you know, that might not serve our purposes too well with the public. And I also, as an intensivist and a teacher, prefer to take the approach that we're allowing death. The really the but for is, but for my intervention, they would have died three days ago. Uh, I'm now allowing a natural death. And, and that may be a, a, a semantic distinction, yeah. but I think it's an important one. And I also worry about the, the, the effect on society if we come forth and say, oh, I've been killing them for years. Here's just, a, just another group. I know. I, I worry about that, too. You know, um, and I, I certainly... I'm just like you. When I sit down with a family, I say, we're going to withdraw the ventilator and allow your child to die. Um, you know, I think this was a step we took, actually, back in the 1960s when ventilator withdrawal was seen as killing the patient. Uh, if you look back at the famous Kieran Ann Quinlan case where they went to court to have her ventilator withdrawn, the biggest people opposed to it were the physicians who said, we, we're not going to kill patients by withdrawing the ventilator. We're not going to do it. And the, the court essentially said, I don't care about your feelings about it. Families have a right to refuse treatments they don't want. And if that means, you know, whatever you need to do, that's just what it means you need to do. And so we developed this euphemism around allowing to die. I believe it wasn't there all along. It was created because the courts were forcing us to do something that the medical profession initially felt was unethical. And we've become accustomed to it over the years, and we're comfortable using those words. But I don't think they're quite accurate for what's going on. And, you know, just like the notion of brain death came to be slowly accepted in society, I think more honest ways of looking at what we do have the potential to become accepted within society. You raised the question, uh, or the question was raised about how the recipients uh, participate in the selection. And in the Denver experience, they actually uh, get informed consent at the time of listing that uh, the child's donor could come from either an right. ABO incompatible, a DCD, or a brain dead donor. So the family d did know in that instance. I didn't know that, thank you. The other uh, nuance in the Denver experience was the first patient actually went two minutes uh, before they declared brain death. Okay. Then it went back to the ethics, the ethics committee actually intervened on behalf, presumably, of the recipients and pushed the time to 75 seconds. That really was not uh, initiated by the investigators, as I understand, in the actual text as it was published in the New England Journal. So let me just say I spoke to the chair of the Ethics Committee, and he would not agree with your account of this. So was that not the, the way it was written in the, in the article? The article was written that the, ethic, that the Ethics Committee was involved and approved of the 75 seconds. Okay. But I think I better just stop there. But let me just say that the, there's, there's dispute about how, and also did, did not go to the IRB. Um, this was not an IRB, you know, so there's a lot of interesting stuff about the Denver Protocol. They, they, they invited the coroner to come into the operating room, is my understanding, to declare the patient's dead at 75 seconds so that legally they would not be questioned about that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story, and I'm sure there's much that, that none of us, except perhaps those who are intimately involved, really know. Uh, you mentioned the situation in Spain, which is a communitarian society where we are not, and there's universal health care. Yeah. If you put health care, the health care situation in this country into the equation, how does that change it? If, if at all, not only for the donor, but for the recipient. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, the, um, you know, certainly having universal health care is a message about a communitarian spirit that we lack in this country. Um, there, has, there has been a minority in Spain, though, that has actually been quite critical of even the system that they have in the following sense, that um, Spain, they devote more of their health care budget 
to the transplantation enterprise than any other developed country. So this, in some ways, has become kind of their, their the, the, I don't know, the, the thing that they like to point to is their successes around organ transplantation. And people within Spain have questioned, why are we prioritizing that ab among, above all of the other health care needs that we have? So um, here again, you know, I think that the great model of Spain has, uh, has interesting ripples to it that, that deserve a uh, deeper look. It's interesting from a historical perspective how this has evolved because if you think back to the 60s when heart transplantation began, there was no brain, there was no real brain death criterion and in South Africa and in the rest of the world because it started in South Africa, right. most or all of the patients were DCD patients and we have come up with this moniker now that we use but the fact of the matter is that there would be no heart transplantation programs anywhere had there not been DCD programs because Initially, there was uh, an argument between a lot of the doctors about, well, when do we get to take the heart? And in most institutions, somebody said, you have to wait till the heart stops. So we've sort of created this whole level of discussion that was not there initially. And I, I think from a historical perspective, it's interesting the way we've, we've pulled this out, but nobody says, well, actually, this is the way we used to do it all yeah. the time. And that brain death caught up with the surgical techniques. It wasn't the other way around. So you are absolutely correct that DCD was the oldest form of, heart tran of uh, transplantation. But I, uh, and I'm not an historian, but my understanding of the first heart transplant in Cape Town was that the, the donor was uh, neurologically devastated, was taken to the OR with the heart beating. And as they looked at the beating heart, they were reluctant to remove it while it was beating. And so they bathed it in a ice water plegic solution to get it to stop first, and then took it out. <laughs> and there were astute reporters, apparently, in the audience afterwards who were pointing out, well, you know, was the donor dead? Well, yeah, he was dead. His heart stopped. Well, how did his heart stop? And I guess Christian Bernard was not very good in front of audiences, and fortunately his brother was there and stepped in and, and managed to finesse some sort of an answer to that. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's intriguing now, but you're absolutely right about, especially kidney donation, DCD protocols were the standard for many years before, before brain death became employed. I can't resist taking the uh, uh, prerogative of the moderator. My patient was, in fact, how we established brain death as a legal precedent in the state of Washington. One. Two, the common statement, the euphemisms that we use about the heart are really quite striking. I love you with all my liver. I love you with all my brain. No, I love you with all my heart. So in fact, the common law statement about death, the legal and generally accepted statement in 1978 was in fact stoppage of the heart. And we went through a whole uh, fairly elaborate process here. I, actually, our patient didn't, didn't his, he was brain dead. There was no perfusion of his brain. But he died when his heart stopped. It was only after that that, in fact, the legal precedent for brain death occurred in this state. So there are these problems societally when we talk about it, and, and you, you're, much of your conversation really swirls around the adult conversation. When we're talking about the pediatric conversation, I suspect that one of the things that's going to be mentioned in the back is who is the competent decider? Yeah. How do we do these things? So as the um, resident who took care of the patient who had donation after cardiac death here and also the patient that received his liver, I thought a lot about DCD and came to many of the same conclusions that you did um, or you have presented. But then my sticking point was um, slippery slope and how neurologically devastated is neurologically devastated enough? Um, how would that be interpret interpreted within the ICUs and also how would that be interpreted within the lay media? Um, I don't know what thoughts you have on that. Yeah, I think that the slippery slope concerns are very real, but uh, the, the, the point I want to make is that we are dealing with these in spades already every day. Think about your ICU practice. We're making decisions to withdraw life support on patients all the time in the face of uncertainty about their neurological prognosis. Um, we are already well on that slippery slope. Now, this does add the complicating conflict of interest that now we're talking not only about whether a child lives or dies, but also whether the organs are going to be used for transplant. But I would say that it's not like it's a brand new issue for us. 
we're already having to look at neurological devastation. And certainly anything I would propose would be to say that in order to be an organ donor, one would have to be at the far end of neurological injury. Whereas right now in my ICU, we're often making these life and death decisions much further from that far end. Bob, I want to sort of disaggregate the question about donation with the issue of the definition of death. And as you pointed out from your Sanjay Gupta quote, there's a lot of senses that brain death is different from other types of ways of dying. So my question is on the opposite side. When you have a family whom doesn't believe that brain death is really dead, how do you approach that? I know in some states, for example, there's religious exemptions for brain death. I'm curious to hear your take on that, those issues. Yeah, I, I got to admit to you that I, I am totally schizophrenic when it comes to this. When I sit down with a family um, who, and I'm, we're about to have a brain death discussion, I tell them that brain death is death. Um, I tell them there's no question about it. I say that, you know, if we're going to donate organs, we'll de declare your child dead first. I follow the party line totally. I don't believe there's a, there's a role for me as a clinician in an ICU to raise any of the stuff that I've talked with you about this morning. Um, and so I've got, a, I've got a split brain about this. Um, I think it would be very destructive and inappropriate for me to bring my rather idiosyncratic views into the clinical world. Can we give Bob a big hand? It's extraordinary. Thank you. Thanks. Very well done. And you are right. You are comfortable with the questions. It's really a good deal. It's actually, you know.